Hello everyone, welcome again to Biofluid Mechanics and um, today what we're going to do is uh, implement the um, concept of the left ventricular assist device into our long parameter model of the cardiovascular circuit and uh, remember that last lecture we went over the, uh, uh, the concept and the applications and also the formulation of how we would take a, a, a pump and add it as, in, 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 as a parallel branch in the cardiovascular circuit and how would we just actually uh, model that into the set of equations. So what we're going to do today is uh, talk about the actual implementation of that and go through a MathCAD spreadsheet uh, to visualize the results and look at the different parameters that we can play with. And we're also going to be discussing additional uh, issues with these, uh, with these uh, implementation of, LDA, of LDATs and things that can actually happen when, when these, these uh, apparatus are actually implanted. All right, so let's go to the notes. So this is uh, biofluid mechanics. And this will be lecture number 25. So we're talking about the uh, simplified lumped parameter model LPM of the cardiovascular system with an LVAT. So we're going to add the LVAT now to the circuit. So let's draw the circuit again and uh, remember we start uh, we're going to go from right to left, from left to right, I'm sorry. And uh, we start with a node corresponding to the left atrium and the corresponding compliance of the left atrium. Then the resistance of the mitral valve and the actual <laughs> mitral valve diode. And then this node representing the pressure of the left ventricle connected to the compliance of the left ventricle, which is a function of time dictated by the um, Restergiopolis double heel function. Furthermore, I'm not going to write uh, the left ventricle pressure here yet uh, because there's going to be an additional branch there. There's the um, resistance of the aortic valve, the actual aortic valve, and then a note here corresponding to the aortic pressure connected to the compliance of the aorta. Furthermore, we have the resistance of the aorta and the inductance of the aorta. So this will be RAO, LAO, and the corresponding flow through the aorta. And finally, we have the systemic pressure and the corresponding resistance of the systemic circulation and the systemic pressure is a state variable that is connected to the compliance of the systemic circulation and then this actually goes around this way with the flow always following this direction Okay, now the LVAD is basically a parallel connection between the left ventricular section and the aortic section. And the way we're going to implement this is by taking a branch out of this node and uh, with a corresponding resistance, an inductor, um, and then this, we're going to call this the resistance of the inlet cannula and the inductor of the inlet cannula and then the pump itself which we call hp it's a function of t and it's just a voltage generator and it's going to end up being a function of time as you will see even though this is supposed to be a continuous flow pump axial pump but uh 
it is going to end up being a function of time because it basically draws blood from this location, which is a function of time. This will be the pressure of the left ventricle of this node. Okay. Inherent to this pump, we have a corresponding resistance of the pump and we have an inductor of the pump. In addition to that, we have an outlet cannula with the corresponding resistance and inductor. So this will be the resistance of the outlet cannula, the inductor of the outlet cannula, and connecting here uh, with the uh, pressure at the aorta. What is that note? So going through this inductor, we have the flow circulating through the pump, as well as going through this inductor, we have exactly the same flow, QP of the pump. So it's basically an additional loop or an additional mesh or branch that stems out of these two nodes. And we already went through the formulation. Basically, we can use, we can simply use Ohm's law and, and Reese's law to look at the pressure drop between this point and this point as a result of what happens in, with the three resistors and what happens with these three inductors and the, adding the gain due to the pump itself. So the state variables, y1 through y6 now we have six state variables this is a six degree of freedom system will be the pressure of the left atrium same order the first five pressure of the left ventricle the pressure of the aorta the flow through the aorta the systemic pressure and q of the pump this will be y1 through y6 now notice that uh, um, even though we have two inductors here, or actually three, because there's an inductor inside the pump, uh, they all see exactly the same flow. So this is a single state variable, not multiple ones. So basically we had established that the pressure drop between this location and this location this pressure drop, which can be calculated through this branch using the equation for this for this valve, very simple, uh, Ohm's law plus the step function of the valve, uh, or times the step function of the valve, can also be calculated through the upper branch because they see exactly the same pressure drop. So it would be um, Ohm's law, then Henry's law, minus the corresponding head gain through the pump such that our star is a combination of in series resistances and L star is also the combination of in series inductances. So that's what we have. So that basically adds another row to the set of equations and another column, obviously, if we need to end up with a square system of equations. Uh, six by six is similar equations. Uh, so we have a six row and the and the equations that is given by these by these by these uh, additional equations uh, e equation and then we have additional columns uh, or an additional column to the set of equations. So only equation two and equation three will be affected by what happens in this branch. This one, this and this one, and this equation. Equation one, equation four, and equation five are not affected by what happens in this particular branch. Okay. So, recall also that we had we had established the um, the fact that we had a. I'm oh, sorry. This is power. This is P for power, not resistance. The power of the motor is given by the voltage supplied to the motor times the current supplied to the motor, and this will be in watts, right? And we can also account for power hydrodynamically. The power of the pump is basically the change of pressure in the pump times the flow, times the flow rate. The change of pressure is this. Obviously, if the head gain is given in millimeters of mercury, we multiply times density of mercury in gravity to get pascals. And the flow rate in meter cubes per second, not in milliliters per second, will end up being also the same type of units, units of power, watts, and fundamental units. So we can equate, because 
the motor and the pump are connected to each other. We can equate one to each other through an efficiency, where eta is inefficiency. So the transmission efficiency of the electric power to the hydrodynamic power. Okay. Now, however, this efficiency will be assumed to be one, that's 100% efficiency, because pump losses are already accounted for in the resistance of the pump and the inductance of the pump. So there's already part of the pump losses that are accounted for, so therefore we don't need to uh, add additional additional losses through an efficiency, through a mechanical efficiency. So if we equate the motor, um, the, I'm sorry, this will be the opposite. Um, the pump power would be equal to the uh, motor power um, through an efficiency. So the amount of uh, power produced electrically will be multiplied by a number between zero and one to, to yield a, a hydrodynamic power. So the the pump motor, the pump power is density gravity hp q and the electric power is voltage times current times intensity so with these we can solve for hp as vi divided by rho hg times g times 1 divided by QP of T. So it is inversely related to the pump flow. Okay, so there it is. So all we have to do is just incorporate these into the set of equations, and that's the sixth equation of the system that we uh, formulated here. This, this will be HP. Um, so if we let 1 over rho hg times gravity be equal to some parameter gamma. Uh, so we don't have to always enter those values and do the unit conversion. This will turn out to be 2,495 millimeters of mercury times milliliters per second divided by volt amp, which is watts. Volt times amps is watts. So this is already formulated in the appropriate units of millimeters and milliliters per second so that you can enter the flow in milliliters per second and the voltage in the current and volt and volt and amps. So essentially HP is equal to gamma VI divided by QP. And that is the equation that is going to be added to this set of equations. So if we introduce this back into the equations, we'll have PLV minus PAO is equal to R star QP plus L star DQP DT minus the pump head, which is gamma VI divided by QP. All right. So what we need to do is then isolate the derivative here to formulate the actual state equation. DQP dt is then equal to um, 1 over L star times PLV minus 1 over L star times uh, PAO. Uh, minus R star over L star times QP plus gamma B I L star over QP. And that is the equation now to be added to the system. Remember this is Y6. This one is Y2. 
this one is y3, this one is y6. So you can see what the elements of the matrix will be. There will be uh, these, uh, these coefficients in the second column of the sixth row, this one in the third column of the sixth row, this one in the sixth column of the sixth row, and this one will go to the right hand side, even though it multiplies qp, it multiplies the sixth state variable, but the inverse of it. So this equation is nonlinear. So this cannot be actually brought back into the matrix. It would actually have to be kept in the right hand side vector of independent terms. So note that these new equation is nonlinear and therefore special attention should be given to error control and validation. as it is imperative to prevent flow rate values, in particular QP of T, from being zero or negative. If at any point in the integration process or in this uh, approximate solution uh, process, this value reaches zero or it becomes negative, this value will blow up, hence blowing everything up in the, in the system of equation. Um, it is also important to set up non-zero initial conditions for the flow state variables. That is for QAO at time equals zero or Y4 at time equals zero and QP at time equals zero equals y6 at time equals zero. So we have to set up some non-zero initial conditions uh, so that these equations don't blow up. All right, also notice, also notice from the circuit that QAO of time includes both the cardiac output and the pump flow, the ELVA pump flow. So therefore, QAO of T is the total flow. See, if you look at the circuit, what we solve for as QAO is right after the junction when the LVAP comes back. So QAO contains both what's coming out of the ventricle through the aortic valve and what's coming out of the LVAP together. So this is the total flow. Okay. If we want to calculate just the cardiac output, we will have to calculate, calculate, calculate that through the, through the valve equation. If we want to know what the pump flow is, all we have to do is just find out what Q6 is. If we want to, the easiest way to know what the actual cardiac output is, is to take QAO and subtract QP from it, and that will give you the flow through here. All right. Now, physiologically, and practically, correct values of LVAT parameters 
must be must be set up. That is, if for example we drive the Elva motor with a 12 volt, volt battery, then we should actually be imposing a current anywhere between 0 0.01 amps to 1 amp to achieve a, a realistic value of flow through the pump. And as you will see, uh, as you will see today in the, in the implementation that we perform in MAPCA. All right. So this is essentially a summary, not a summary, but a, an extension of what we had done in the previous lecture and how we're going to be implementing this on, on, on MAPCA. Um, in addition, we can perform some post-processing. For the purpose of control, we talked about the, the issue of these uh, assist devices actually being manually controlled and, and not being able to adjust to the level of activity of the person who's, who's wearing it. So LVAD model, post-processing, and control. All right, so once the LVAD pump head gain, that's HP of T, has been determined. From the pump flow, QP, remember we have this equation, HP is equal to uh, this parameter gamma that we had calculated, which is nothing but a scaling factor, divided by QP times the voltage in the intensity such that the gamma is 7,495 and that would be millimeters of mercury divided by milliliters second divided by volts and amp. Okay, we can, because this pump is a an actual flow pump, there's a direct mechanical relationship between the head gain and the angular speed, basically the RPM. A relationship between pump speed RPM and pump head for rotating actual pumps may be implemented. S. So, in the case of axial flow pumps, there's this mechanical relation. It's very simple, where the head gain is related is related to the square of the angular speed. Um, so, we could calculate the speed as the square root of the head gain divided by beta. So, where these beta so for the case of the heart mate pump, which is one of the ones most widely used pumps, actual, actual flow pumps, beta is equal to 9.9025 times 10 to the minus 7 millimeters of mercury divided by RPM squared. So we can directly calculate the RPM from here. So why is it important to calculate the RPM? Um, well, because this is one of the variables that is directly attainable, directly measurable, measurable through things as simple sensors, as simple as optical sensors. You can actually measure the RPM of a pump. And that number can be brought back into the, into the uh, display of the LVAT system and actually used as part of the uh, of a control system 
to control the speed of the pump. Okay, we cannot control the speed of the pump directly. We can control the current that we supply to the pump, and then we can use this as a as a as a feedback variable to actually uh, uh, control uh, what what the pump is doing and if it's actually satisfying the physiological demand. So, but notice the nonlinear relation between the pump speed and the head gain. And thus, between the pump speed and the pump flow. So remember that the uh, HP is related to the inverse of the pump flow and therefore omega, which is the rotating speed in RPM, is related to the square root of the inverse of the, of the flow, uh, of the pump flow. So we have a whole set of nonlinear relationships here that would make a, a control system ever more uh, unstable and, and difficult to control. So in addition to that, notice that uh, even though this is, um, this is an axial flow, continuous flow pump is designed and built to be that way. Um, if we set it, at, if we set the pump at a constant, we'll supply with a constant voltage through a battery, and then we supply with a constant current, it will generate a head gain that is inversely proportional to the flow. And that flow is a function of time. Okay, it's a function of time because it's a combination of the flows that uh, are, are in those junctions in the aorta and in the, in the ventricle. So this is going to end up being a function of time. If this is a function of time, as a function of the cardiac cycle, then omega will also be a function of time. So even though we're supplying a constant value of voltage and current to the pump, the pump will end up having a variable and oscillating uh, 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 rotating speed. So... This results in a pump flow or pump not flow speed omega t that is clearly dependent on time. Throughout the heart cycle. So we might see a signal of the pump speed that goes up and down with the heart cycle. So this uh, omega t, which is the RPM, cannot be set as the control variable in a feedback control loop. So this is a, a variable that is really accessible. This is a number that we can measure very easily through optical sensors. Um, we have a shaft that is rotating at, uh, at a certain speed and we can just calculate it directly. However, it is not going to be possible to use it directly. So essentially, a secondary parameter such as the current I supplied, supplied to the Elbat motor could be the control variable in a feedback loop. control loop because that's one that we can alter directly by you know, a potentiometer or adjusting the dial on the pump itself so the objective of 
a feedback control loop could be or should be to produce the necessary flow to satisfy satisfy physiological demand. So again the physiological demand is dictated by how the person's level of activity is. So if it's a low level of activity then it doesn't need to, the person doesn't need that much blood. The pump should actually slow down. If the uh, person is active then it requires more blood uh, then the pump should actually uh, the, the, the pump uh, power should be increased but it cannot be increased directly to the speed it has to be increased to a secondary variable like the current so basically QAO which is the total flow is uh, ejection plus what the LVAT is producing should be targeted to satisfy the demand. So the physiological demand is a dynamic objective as it varies varies mainly with the patient's level of activity. Okay. So this is not an easy uh, it's not an easy uh, system that needs to, that could be set up here. Um, the level of activity could be indirectly determined by the systemic resistance. Or systemic. So if we had a way to um, kind of uh, predict what the systemic resistance is based on different parameters or different signatures in the flow or in the pressure signals, um, then we should be able to actually use this in reverse to determine how much flow the person will need. And as, as, no, as soon as we know how much flow the person will need, we can adjust the power that we provide or the current that we provide to the L, but so the, the total flow satisfies the demand. And we can do that through a very simple feedback control loop. And so this forms the basis of how we actually uh, would, in fact, uh, control this, this pump automatically rather than the uh, state-of-the-art manual uh, control systems that, that exist. Okay, so I've, I've actually, uh, I will share some presentations uh, after after these uh, lectures uh, and some some papers that I've written with some uh, collaborators on how to set this up and, and how to go about designing this this feedback control controller. Now, in addition, there's something that we need to worry about, and I mentioned this last class. We are drawing blood from the ventricle to pass it through a pump so that we can send it back to the aorta. Now, the ventricle functions as part of this uh, closed circuit. Um, and uh, if we increase, for example, the, the level of the, of the pump, if we increase the power of the pump, then we might run the risk of trying to draw blood that is actually not available in, in the ventricle. So we might actually surpass the availability of blood. And that leads to something called ventricular 
suction. Let's briefly talk about what this is and how to actually model it in the system uh, to perhaps um, implement it as part of the feedback control system so that we can prevent it. It's actually not that difficult to prevent. Is the ventricular suction is a phenomenon that occurs when the LVAT is operated at a level that is higher than the threshold causing or higher than a threshold causing the ventricle to collapse as the elbow tries to draw more blood than what is available. So there's a certain threshold that needs to be surpassed. And we can actually determine what the threshold is. And it's basically, it's a point where the, the, there's not enough blood in the, in the ventricle for the pump to draw, and the, 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 the pump continues to attempt to draw it, and then it would just basically collapse the ventricle. These phenomena may be modeled as an added nonlinear resistor in the circuit. So I'm going to concentrate on the branch that goes between the pressure in the left ventricle and the pressure in the aorta, where we have the inlet cannula. So this is the inlet cannula, sorry, this is RI and LI, and then coming back, we have the outlet cannula, resistor, and inductor. And then we have the pump itself, um, but we're going to have this resistor called RU, which is a time variable resistor. So it's a resistor that changes its functional time. We have the resistor that corresponds to the pump itself, which was previously drawn inside the pump, but this is another way of doing it. And then the LVAT pump itself, HP. So um, this is the direction of flow, usually, obviously. That is the direction of flow. So, so essentially, the pressure drop between the left ventricle and the aorta is equal to a sum of some resistances here, which is Ri plus Rsu plus Rp plus Rmo times Qp plus the sum of that, some inductances Le, Li plus LP plus LO times DQP DT minus the head gain. And we've already established this, so the only new thing here is this RSU. So this whole thing we call L star, and this whole thing we're going to keep calling R star. Okay. It's just that, in essence, what happens is that as the ventricle, as the elva tries to draw more blood, there will be a resistor or something that acts as a, as a resistor that would actually trickle up, not just trickle, but just shoot up immediately 
after you pass that threshold and uh, and and just prevent more flow from going. So for adult human applications, the suction resistance RSU is, so it works like this. So RSU is equal to zero if the pressure in the left ventricle is l greater than some threshold, B bar, and it's equal to alpha times the difference between those pressures if the pressure in the left ventricle is less than that P bar. So it's like a step function. Same thing as this, you can establish this with a with a heavy side step function H, uh, when the argument of the step function would be the difference between these two pressures. So when it's positive, it's zero, and when it's negative, it's, it's one. So you do the inverse of the, uh, not the inverse, but the negative of the argument. Okay, so in this type of cases, alpha is minus 3.5 milliliters per second to the minus one. So remember that the units of resistance are millimeters of mercury divided by milliliters second. So alpha has to be in units of inverse of milliliters second. And the threshold of the pressure is one millimeter mercury. So this is the threshold. Okay. So when the pressure in the ventricle is less than one millimeter of mercury, then what will happen is that there will be a additional resistance that will shoot up and keep increasing the farther away you are from that millimeter mercury by a factor of 3.5 milliliters of mercury, uh, milliliters per second by millimeters of mercury by every millimeter of mercury. So, if this model is implemented, a change in the signature of the flow signal may be recognized. So if you introduce this additional resistance that actually changes as, as the pressure conditions change, there will be a change in pattern in the, uh, in the signature of the pump flow. Um, so you can see that instead of being maybe having a specific frequency, uh, you'll, you'll see a couple of underlying harmonics or underlying frequencies uh, 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 attached to that. So you can use some pattern recognition type of algorithms to determine when this happens and then tell the pump flow, you, you can incorporate this into the active feedback control loop and say, okay, if I recognize this, this particular signature, go on and, and slow down the pump because you're about to enter suction. So maybe uh, recognize as the ventricle is about to enter suction state. And this can be used to send a signal to the feedback controller. to reduce the pump speed. And alarm the patient of the situation so that he or she reduces the level of activity, so re thereby reducing the physiological demand. So this is a very actual simple way of, uh, of determining this. You can use a very, uh, not a very sophisticated uh, pattern recognition of so machine learning to, to look at the pump signal, at the pump flow signal. Um, and uh, again, 
Uh, the only things that we can measure from the system directly is probably the, the pump speed. There's no way that we can implement a flow sensor uh, directly in situ inside the patient or even a pressure sensor, nothing that interrupts the, 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 the flow itself. But a very simple optical sensor can actually determine the pump speed, omega. So if you have the pump speed, omega, you can actually calculate the pump head. With the pump head, you can actually calculate the pump flow. And if you look at the pump flow and you plot it on the fly, in situ, you can actually see if, if there are special patterns in that pump flow, if there are underlying harmonics in the signal, that can actually be a telltale sign that something bad is about to occur. And then you can actually uh, alarm the patient, say, well, calm down, uh, sit down because something is about to occur. Or you can just simply send a signal to the, to the pump and say, okay, reduce power because um, you're about to, to collapse the ventricle. So this is a another thing that we've actually developed over the years, and and uh, I'll share some some uh, presentations and publications that uh, that deal with these. So let me go back to the to the other camera. Uh, so what we'll do now is uh, we'll implement uh, these not not the suction ideas or the uh, or the feedback controller, but we'll implement the the formulation of the ELBA directly on a MathCAD spreadsheet, so you can see how simple it is to just basically add another equation to the system and uh, what are the type of things that we can parameters that we can play with to to determine what what the effect of the LVAD is on a on a on a patient with a with a, some some sort of congestion congestive condition so this is uh the mascot file for lecture 25 and um, so we start with the double heel function and let's start with a case where the emax is equal to 1 remember that E max equal two would be a healthy person. Uh, so let's let's assume that this person has some some sort of condition, underlying conditions, congestion. This, this person has, has suffered a, an infarction or something like that that has reduced the elastins uh, by half. Uh, so uh, we'll assume that this person's heart is actually uh, beating at sixty beats per minute, and uh, this is what the this is the equation for the uh, double heel function, and this is the curve of the elastins over one uh, uh, heart cycle over one second. This is the inverse of the elastins, which is the compliance, and this will be the derivative of the compliance divided by the compliance, which is one of the coefficients of the state system matrix. Okay, remember that we have to be careful with evaluating this derivative because we might find it, that it would crash at some point. So at time equals zero, for example, the derivative evaluates to an imaginary number. So we have to make sure that we uh, shift the evaluation. We, we did that on the previous class. So let's set up uh, the system where with the same exact parameters as before with the resistor. The, the mitral valve has uh, a resistance of 0 0.005 and the left atrium has a compliance of 4.4. The uh, aortic valve has a, a resistance equal to the mitral valve and the compliance of left ventricle is determined by, by the uh, double heel function. The aorta has a resistor, compliance, and inductor as these numbers, these are the same parameters that we used before. And uh, we are, we're gonna assume that the systemic resistance is equal to one, so there's a moderate level of activity. So this patient has suffered some kind of condition, right? So the Emax is equal to one, but this patient is actually standing up and moving around, so the, the systemic resistance is equal to one. Remember, high level of activity would be a resistance of 0 0.5. Low level of activity, resting, laying down, will be a resistance of about two. Okay, the systemic compliance will leave the same at 1.33. These are the parameters of the inlet and outflow cannulas as well as the pump resistors and inductors that we've actually um, uh, talked about last class. And we're gonna use exactly those values, resistances and inductors of the inflow, inflow outflow cannula and pump itself. So the total resistance of the uh, LVAT is RI, RO, and RP, and the total inductance is LI, LO, and LP. These uh, um, parameter, uh, gamma, which is, remember, they're just basically the inverse uh, of uh, the density of uh, mercury and gravity, but with some unit conversion along the way, 7,495. We are going to assume that the these uh, pump is supplied uh, with a battery that has a voltage, it has 12 volts. And let's start with a very low value of, uh, of the current supply to the 
supply to the motor 0 0.01 amps so it's a minimum value they said the dial is at the minimum value so this will create a power of, of uh, 0.12 watts um, let's analyze five hour cycles and each cycle let's uh let's use 2000 time steps this will yield a time step size of five times 10 to the minus four i'm not using adaptive time stepping because it will make this math like math uh, math cat code uh, too large um, but you can see that well the time is not a premium unless you're actually implementing this code inside a feedback controller so for now it's just for illustration purposes so it's okay to use this large uh, the number of time steps uh, 10,000 in total so it will take about a few seconds to actually get a solution which is probably too long to wait if this was implemented in, in practice okay so now the number of state variables is six because we've added a, an additional one qp and the initial conditions will leave the same uh, so the pressure of the left atrium and left ventricle eight at, at, uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the onset of systole the pressure of the aorta is 70 we are going to use a non-zero values for the flow. So the flow in the aorta is 100 and the flow of the pump is 80. Let's see, well, this is just a starting point and then the, the whole system will adapt itself to actually producing uh, realistic values or, or uh, sustained values for these, for these quantities. All right, so these are the four matrices and four vectors. So matrix when the valves are both closed and we're gonna set up all the vectors to be zero, okay? Remember that the sixth element of the right-hand side vector is not zero. The sixth element of the right-hand side vector is actually related to the inverse of the pump flow. But we're going to leave it at zero and then hardwire in the code. We're going to add it as an extra term inside the code. Uh, so this is a matrix when both uh, when uh, the, uh, the mitral valve is open and the aortic valve is closed. This is the matrix when the mitral valve is closed and the aortic valve is open. This is during injection. And this is a matrix when both valves are open, which remember we said that this is unfeasible. This doesn't happen physiologically, but um, this is something that we are uh, we, we have to allow mathematically in case uh, this, this, the conditions uh, are such that this matrix is going to have to be evaluated. So that the, the algorithm has something to look at. All right, so again, the same way we did this before, uh, we are going to actually at every time step calculate the matrices that the matrices and vectors that we are going to be using um, depending on uh, the uh, predictor or corrector of the runge kuta scheme remember predictor k1 is calculated at time equal t uh, predictor uh, corrector k2 and k3 are calculated at times equal t plus a half delta t and corrector k4 is calculated at time equal t plus delta t so uh, these are calculated that way so if the uh, pressure and the on the left atrium is larger than the pressure on the left ventricle that means that the, uh, the mitral valve will be open and if the pressure on the uh, left ventricle is less than the pressure of the aorta that means that the aortic valve will be closed so we'll, we're going to use the oc um, uh, matrix and vector oc 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 for all both predictors and correctors if the aortic valve, if the pressure in the left atrium is less than the pressure in the left ventricle, that means that the mitral valve is open. But if the pressure of the left ventricle is larger than the pressure of the aorta, that means that the aortic valve will be open. And then we'll use the CO vectors. And finally, if the, the left, if the left atrium pressure is larger than the left ventricular pressure and the left ventricular pressure is larger than the aortic pressure, and both valves will be open. Again, this will not happen physiologically, but we have to allow that condition to be possible in the algorithm. Okay, so we know now what combinations of A1, A2, A3, A4 will be used. And by the way, all B1, B2, B3, and B4 are zeros for every case, um, but we're going to hardwire something into the equation. So the predictor K1 for each of the state variables is started with the right-hand side vector, but notice that I'm adding that term to the sixth element of that vector, gamma times the voltage times the current divided by the inductance or the inductor divided by Y6. Y6 will be the, the, the pump flow. These function here called delta. Delta is a function called the Kronecker delta. It's a function that will give you either a zero or a one. It will give you a zero if the two elements in the argument are dif different from each other, and it will give you a one if the two elements of within the argument are uh, the same as each other. So, for example, delta that will be d control g of three comma three will be one, 
but delta of 3,4 will be zero. So if the two arguments are the same, you'll get a one. If the two arguments are equal to each other, you get a, uh, if the two arguments are different from each other, you get a zero. So this is exactly what we need. We'll basically be adding this only to the sixth element of this vector B1. So we're going to be adding that at every stage of the Runge-Kutte scheme, the predictor K1, the corrector K2, the corrector K3, and the corrector K4, right? And we're going to be using the matrix A1 uh, for predictor K1, the matrix A2 uh, uh, plus, ha plus a half of K1 at, uh, at uh, corrector K2, the matrix A3 uh, times the state variables plus a half of K2 for predictor for corrector K3, and the matrix A4 times the state variables plus the full corrector K3 to calculate the corrector K4. And then we uh, linearly combine K1, K2, K3, and K4 in this particular fashion to estimate the solution at the next time step for every single state variable. So this is what we have been doing uh, since the beginning, except that now we have this additional term here that is, uh, that is uh, accounting for that um, right-hand side vector term on the sixth element of the right-hand side vector term. Uh, so this is only going to be this much when uh, k is equal to six. Okay. Other than that, uh, when k is different than six, uh, then this is just going to be zero because delta is equal to zero. So let's see. The first column of the state uh, of the solution vector or the solution array is the pressure of the left atrium. The second column is the pressure of the left ventricle. The third column is the pressure of the aorta. The fourth column is the flow in the aorta. The fifth column is the systemic pressure. And the sixth column is the pump flow. Remember that the aortic flow contains both the pump flow and, and the heart ejection uh, or the cardiac output. In addition to that, we can calculate the uh, head gain in millimeters of mercury uh, within the LVAT as gamma times VI divided by QP. Okay, so now that we know QP, we can calculate another array, array HP and then plot it along with the other, the other pressures. So this is what's going on. Okay, so notice that the pump actually produces a pressure signal. These are, this is all starting from initial conditions. We have a converged solution, so the solution is stable and it's actually sustained. Okay, we have opening and closing of the aortic valve that's relevant, or you can, there's evidence here in the equilibration of the left ventricular pressure and the aortic pressure. Remember that those, those two will be the same when the aortic valve opens up. That's between this point and this point, between this point and this point. See this one, the red line and the blue line are on top of each other. All right, so there's opening and closing of the aortic valve at every beat of the heart. That means that the heart is working, even though Emax is equal to one, the heart's working. All right. Now the LVAT is also producing head gain, and therefore it will be producing some flow, QP. If we plot the flows, the aortic flow and the pump flow, notice that most of the flow comes from the heart itself. That will be the 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 difference between the red line and the blue line. So basically, this peak here, when the aortic valve is open, is what the heart is actually producing. What the pump is producing is under the blue line. Okay. So we can calculate the total flow. And again, this is, I'm going to look at the average of the red line over the last heartbeat between four seconds and five seconds. So during the last cycle, I'm integrating the aortic flow, the red line, and dividing by the period so that I can calculate the average, the integrated average of the pump flow and the 63 milliliters per second. And then I'm turning that into liters per minute and I get 3.7, 3.782. That's probably not enough. That's definitely not enough uh, flow. That's not enough pump flow or action. Remember, this is not just pump flow. This is a combination of the two. It's a red line. This is not enough flow to satisfy the physiological demand when the systemic resistance is equal to one. This person is walking and it might need about five liters per minute to be able to withstand that level of activity. So what happens is that we need to have a system that detects that and then tells the pump, okay, increase the level. So I'm going to dial it to five right now. 0 0.05 uh, uh, amps. That means the uh, power of 0 0.6 watts. And let's see what happens. So as you can see, the pressures increase. This this blue line, this light blue line, is the head gain of the 
of the LVAT. So it's actually producing a head gain that is equivalent to what the heart is producing. There is still some uh, ejection from the ventricle. There's cardiac output, and that's relevant in this section from here to here when the, the, the aortic valve is actually opening up in every one of these cycles. It's opening up ever so slightly, just a little bit for a little bit of the heart cycle is opening up, but it's opening up. And you can actually, this is evidenced very clearly in these peaks right here. The red line is the total flow. It's the aortic flow is the total flow. The blue line is what the pump is producing. You can see now that the pump is producing quite a bit more flow, right, than before. But the heart is still producing something, okay? You can actually calculate this and update it and now we have 4.378 so it's not yet quite five but we don't know if five is the right number we need to have a a, a smart feedback controller to, to be able to determine what is the actual physiological demand for a patient for this particular patient whose systemic resistance is currently one so if we if we go okay this might not be enough and i know that the heart cannot do more than this let's double this let's set the dial to 10. So now the current is 0 0.1 amps. So what will happen now is we'll see a lot more flow coming out of the elva. So much flow coming out of the elva that the blue line and the red line are now never in equilibrium. So essentially the aortic valve is now never opening. The elva is producing so much flow that it's not allowing the heart to actually eject any flow. So as you can see now, the red line and the blue line are right on top of each other. That is the total cardiac output. And if we calculate this, now we have 5.29 liters per minute. Okay, so we have 5.29 liters per minute. We are maybe satisfying the physiological demand, but we are not letting the heart work. The heart is not actually, it's beating, but it's not opening and closing the valve. So that can actually lead to, uh, to further problems. Like for example, the damaging of the of the aortic of the aortic valve because it's it's, it's, not, it's not functioning. It also leads to more problems because the the ventricle is not recovering. The idea of the LVAD is that it's a bridge to recovery, so that you have to let the ventricle actually work a little bit so that it exercises and recovers from the lesion that it was produced by the infarction or the congestion. Okay, so this, as you can see, it does the job, but it definitely is not letting the heart do the job of recovering. In addition to that, we don't know if we are actually drawing too much blood so that we are in, in, in at risk of collapsing the ventricle. We might be actually approaching suction. We don't know that yet because in this particular system, we did not include the resistance of suction. So we only have, in, in terms of the LVAD, we only have the inlet, outlet, and pump resistance. We didn't have, we don't have RSU yet. And this is something that we can very easily add to the algorithm. We can actually hardwire it here in the algorithm that uh, that resistance as a as a function of, of the pressure itself so this is um this is how this works and i'm going to bring it down i'm going to assume okay this uh this system actually send an alarm to the patient and say okay you have to calm down so the patient calmed down and, and went into rust okay with systemic resistance equal to two and now we went back to 0 0.01 let's see what happens see now the pump is working the aortic valves opening and closing at every heartbeat there is heart ejection there is pump ejection and the uh the the, the blood flow is only 2.28 um uh 2.28 uh but uh, but again uh this this patient is now gone into into full rest the, the level of activity went so low that the systemic resistance went to one to two. Okay, so we can go back to um, activity and things will change. So this, as I'm doing it manually, can all be automated in a in a feedback control loop, uh, but obviously in, in one where the code is not programmed in, in MathCAD, the code is, is actually um, uh, streamlined to, to be more efficient. Uh, there's uh, error adaption, time, time, control, time step control, so that it works efficiently, works fast, and we can actually prevent these conditions on a heartbeat by heartbeat basis. So um, let me go back to the camera 
this is uh, what I wanted to go over today, and um, this is the implementation of uh, of the LDAP and uh, into the lump parameter model of the cardiovascular system. Um, obviously, as I said, there's many more things that can be done in this cardiovascular circuit. As I will show you in some presentations that I will post for, for the last uh, couple of lectures, uh, I, will, I will post some presentations for you to go over that include some uh, state-of-the-art research that we're performing where we are actually uh, doing some multi-scale analysis and have these lump parameter models of in the orders of 40s and 50s state variables. Okay, so well, thank you for your attention, and um, I'll see you uh, during the office hours or in the next lecture. Goodbye.